Peace be with you. Alleluia, Christ is risen. The Lord is risen indeed. Alleluia. May his grace and peace be with you. May he fill your hearts with joy. Friends, a very happy Easter to you all. It's a great joy to celebrate the resurrection of our Lord with you today. All that you need to participate fully in today's service is an open mind and an open heart. To hear again the great story of Jesus' triumph over death and the grave. And to consider all that it means for us today. We begin with that ancient hymn of praise, the glory to God. And say with me now, glory to God in the highest and peace to his people on earth. Lord God, heavenly King, almighty God and Father, we worship you, we give you thanks, we praise you for your glory. Lord Jesus Christ, only Son of the Father, Lord God, Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Have mercy on us. You are seated at the right hand of the Father. Receive our prayer. For you alone are the Holy One, you alone are the Lord. You alone are the Most High, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit, in the glory of God the Father. Amen. Let us pray. Lord of life and power, through the mighty resurrection of your Son, you have overcome the old order of sin and death and have made all things new in him. May we, being dead to sin and alive to you in Jesus Christ, reign with him in glory, who with you and the Holy Spirit is alive, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our first reading from the Acts of the Apostles, chapter 10. Then Peter began to speak to the Gentiles. I truly understand that God shows no partiality, but in every nation, anyone who fears him and does what is right is acceptable to him. You know the message he sent to the people of Israel, preaching peace by Jesus Christ. He is Lord of all. That message spread throughout Judea, beginning in Galilee, after the baptism that John announced, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power, how he went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. We are witnesses to all that he did, both in Judea and in Jerusalem. They put him to death by hanging him on a tree but God raised him on the third day and allowed him to appear, not to all the people, but to us who were chosen by God as witnesses and who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. He commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one ordained by God as judge of the living and the dead. All the prophets testify about him that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And our Easter Gospel reading from the Gospel according to St. Luke, chapter 24. But on the first day of the week, at early dawn, they came to the tomb taking the spices that they had prepared. They found the stone rolled away from the tomb, but when they went in, they did not find the body. While they were perplexed about this, suddenly two men in dazzling clothes stood beside them. The women were terrified and bowed their faces to the ground, but the men said to them, why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here, but has risen. Remember how he told you, while he was still in Galilee, 
that the Son of Man must be handed over to sinners and be crucified, and on the third day rise again. Then they remembered his words, and returning to, from the tomb, they told all this to the eleven and to all the rest. Now it was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary the mother of James, and the other women with them who told this to the apostles. But these words seemed to them an idle tale, and they did not believe them. But Peter got up and ran to the tomb. Stooping and looking in, he saw the linen cloths by themselves. Then he went home, amazed at what had happened. This is the Gospel of Christ. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Well, my friends, this Easter day is the great Christian feast. This Easter day, radiant with the brightness of the Lord, is the holiest occasion of the Christian year, when we remember how death could not hold the Lord of life. And remembering, remembering as the church remembers, this is the day when Jesus broke the bonds of sin and death. This is the day when Jesus rose triumphant from the dead. This is the moment of resurrection, this day, this time, now. That's the way the church remembers. There's a word for it, anamnesis. It's the opposite of amnesia, where we can't remember anything at all. The way that the church remembers is literally to remember, to take something that happened before, perhaps long ago, and to graft it on to our present body, to incorporate it into our present common life, to announce as then, as now, as yet to be, to remember Jesus and his resurrection requires us to say that the resurrection is not just back there and back then, but here and now and for us. That might sound strange. You might say that it takes quite a lot of mental acrobatics to do this, to play as though the thing that happened long ago and far away just happened or rather is happening in this time and in this place. And yes, that would be true. If we were all dressed up in period costume on a stage, perhaps the backdrop cleverly painted to resemble an empty tomb, all of us feigning astonishment at its emptiness. It would be true if we treated church as Civil War reenactors treat the fields of Gettysburg or Manassas but that's not what we're doing. The key to understanding how the church remembers is to understand the central claim of the Christian faith and the cause of our celebration, that Jesus Christ, very God and very man, is alive, that he lives. And because he is alive, all of his experience, all of his life's journey, all of his story of birth and life, of suffering, of joy, of death, and of resurrection has a bearing on our common life. That Jesus is alive, that the one whom we call Lord lives, and that we gather to celebrate and bear witness to his life means quite simply that what we do in church and at home this day and at all other times can never simply be a reenactment like a history buff's amusement, no. The church gathers to remember Christ, to remember him, to graft Christ's eternal life to our own life, and so to find ourselves members of his risen body. Let's talk about the gospel account of the resurrection. 
Each of the four Gospels recounts the resurrection slightly differently, as you may know. The Gospels don't agree on the precise details, the precise unfolding of events. And their emphases differ. Some have more to say about Mary Magdalene, others more about Peter or Peter and John together. Were there two angels or one? Was Jesus there to speak to Mary when she supposed him to be the gardener? It can be perplexing to look at these accounts side by each, to string a narrative together from these different strands. Some say that the resurrection accounts, more than anything else, betray the theological agendas of their authors. Others point to different strains of tradition which grew up in the early Christian communities, depending on the initial source of the story. And that second point, I think, directs us much more toward the fundamentally human reason why these accounts differ from one another. You see, my friends, the human memory, the memory of each person is different. An event, particularly a dramatic or traumatic event, will be remembered differently by different people. And here was an event that had never taken place before, an event so dramatic and, in its way, traumatic, that those who experienced it would struggle to put it into words. Some who argue for the inerrancy of Scripture have said that these accounts are one and the same, just with some details present in one and not another. And that actually requires some mental acrobatics. What we can say with confidence is that all of the Scriptures agree that the tomb was empty, that the stone blocking the entrance to the tomb was gone, that Jesus really did rise, not metaphorically. His body rose again, became alive again. There is richness and beauty and truth in each of these accounts, and they should not be synthesized sewn together into a patchwork of this and that to make for one account. No, they should each be read with their own integrity and should be celebrated not just where they agree, but also where they differ. And in that sense, St. Luke's account, which we hear today, stands apart quite significantly. Here we have at least five women going to the tomb of Jesus. Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary, the mother of James, and an unnumbered group of other women with them. When they meet the two men in dazzling clothes who tell them that Jesus is risen, the women remember Jesus' words to them, that he would rise again. And they run to tell the eleven, that is, the disciples, the news they've just heard. And here, in almost withering language, our translation says of the disciples' reaction, but these words seemed to them an idle tale, and they did not believe them. An idle tale. Nonsense is closer to the original Greek. Only Peter seems to clue in, running to the tomb and seeing the linen cloths by themselves, then returning home in amazement. Suffice it to say, friends, this wasn't the last time that men would fail to believe the testimony of women and live to regret it. It's a pretty astounding thing to consider that the disciples thought the women's story was nonsense. The women had no trouble remembering Jesus' words to them that he would rise again. But confronted by these women with the news that Jesus was telling the truth when he foretold his resurrection, Ten of eleven disciples more or less waved their hands and said, Poppycock. Now, why would that be? Perhaps, if we're being generous, because their grief was still so raw. Or perhaps because the disciples had hoped somewhere deep down inside, and despite all evidence to the contrary, that Jesus would indeed eventually turn out to be the muscular, 
and militaristic Messiah that Israel had expected all those long years. And his death on the cross frustrated those expectations. Perhaps they thought that after his death, all Jesus could be for them was a happy memory, growing fainter as the years passed. A man whose life story would die finally with those who knew him in his glory days. Certainly because they failed to realize that Jesus was alive again. Certainly because they didn't yet know that he would be remembered to their group. Luke's gospel tells us that the disciples didn't believe that Jesus had risen until he appeared among them. That even then they thought he was a ghost. That it wasn't until Jesus ate a piece of broiled fish in their presence, something that only a real person with a real body would do, that they truly began to believe that he was alive. Jesus was becoming a memory for them. Then all of a sudden he was remembered and they believed. On this sacred day, we remember as the church remembers. Jesus is not a memory, nor is he the stuff of lore and imagination, one who passed finally away when his last friend on earth wasn't around to tell his story. The proclamation of Easter is the central proclamation of our faith, that Jesus lives that the Lord is alive, and that with our humanity grafted to his, we are also partakers of his divinity. That Christ is remembered here, this day, this moment, now. And what does that mean for us but everything? No more consequential words have been uttered in the history of the world than the proclamation that echoes unbroken from the empty tomb into eternity, that the Lord is risen. Death could not hold the Lord of life. Death has no dominion over him, and so it shall hold no sway over us who are promised to share in his resurrection. This is why St. Paul could write in his letter to the Romans, I am certain that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. And if death doesn't have the last word, my friends. If the common enemy of every living thing is defeated, think of the implications. If death doesn't have the last word, neither does sickness. If death doesn't have the last word, neither does injustice. If death doesn't have the last word, neither does sin or estrangement or abuse or grief. If death has been defeated, if the nagging whisper of death has been shut up by a chorus of hallelujahs, then what is left but life? If no power in heaven or on earth can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord, what is left but life in abundance? What is left but eternal life? What is left but resurrection? What does this wondrous news mean for us but everything? Thanks be to God, and alleluia, and amen. Now, my friends, in joy and hope, let us pray to the source of all life, saying, hear us, Lord of glory. that our risen Savior may fill us with joy, the joy of his holy and life-giving resurrection. Let us pray to the Lord. Hear us, Lord of glory. That isolated and persecuted churches may find fresh strength in the Easter gospel. 
Let us pray to the Lord. Hear us, Lord of glory. That he may grant us humility to be subject to one another in Christian love. Let us pray to the Lord. Hear us, Lord of glory. That he may provide for those who lack food, work, or shelter. Let us pray to the Lord. Hear us, Lord of glory that by his power wars and famine may cease through all the earth. Let us pray to the Lord. Hear us, Lord of glory. That he may reveal the light of his presence to the sick, the weak, and the dying, that they may be comforted and strengthened. Let us pray to the Lord. Hear us, Lord of glory that he may send the fire of the Holy Spirit upon his people, that we may bear faithful witness to his resurrection. Let us pray to the Lord. Hear us, Lord of glory. O God, who on this day, through your only begotten Son, have conquered death and unlocked for us the path to eternity, grant, we pray, that we who keep the solemnity of the Lord's resurrection may through the renewal brought by your spirit rise up in the light of life through our Lord Jesus Christ, your son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. And now as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. May the God of peace, who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant, equip you with everything good, that you may do his will, working in you that which is pleasing in his sight, through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, be with you this day and remain with you always. Amen.